my intention with the puzzles, uh, and I don't know if I succeeded, but this was my original goal at least, was to make them be challenging, but not hard, and not too intellectual. Because basically, I feel like it's a problem a lot of times in games for me when you're playing a game and you're kind of like really enjoying like just the beauty of the world or you're interested in the story, reading the, you know, the lore or whatever, and then you get these just very highly, um, highly analytical intellectual puzzles that sort of just completely take you out of the game and the world that you're existing in. And I, I kind of think that like your emotional brain and your intellectual puzzle solving brain are two separate parts and that you can't sort of fully experience one while experiencing the other. So I never wanted the puzzles to be like really, really complex and hard. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do is I never wanted the puzzles to feel arbitrary. Like I didn't want them to be like, okay, you go to this wall and then have to like, you know, solve this Sudoku puzzle that's on the wall for whatever reason, which will open a door. Uh, Cause to me that anytime I experience that in a game, which is very, very often, as I'm sure you know, that's like most puzzles in games. It just feels like, oh, okay, here the designer made a puzzle because this level was too short and they needed me to like kill 15 minutes like trying to solve some weird puzzle. And so I just wanted all the, the, the quote unquote puzzles to like come out of the world where it was like, you know, with the documents, the, the that little puzzle with the document, why you can't take it out of the room is because, you know, the fathers would never take their documents out of the room and they would do, you know, the way you have to like figure out that you can pass the note back and forth is how the fathers would do it. And with the urns, it's like, you know, they couldn't see, they would never see each other face to face. So the urns couldn't either. Yeah. So I, I think I, I think I mostly did that. Uh, the thing that's challenging about that though is that because of that, you can't really make a lot of puzzles. And I think I think one thing that people, um, if you've never sort of made a game, just if you're if you're just a, a, a player of games and not a developer of games, you sort of don't realize what's what's hard and what's easy. And um, it's actually very easy. Like I, I have sort of an issue in general with the idea of like playtime. Uh, you know, because a lot, and some people uh, categorize the value of a game based on how long it takes to play. Um, and I think what they don't realize is it's actually very easy to make a long game. Like you, I could have doubled or tripled the length of this game with about a week of work. I could have literally made one type of uh, puzzle mechanic and then done just basically more, more and more complex variations on that. Uh, that one mechanic and and increase the length of the game. You know, it's kind of it's like the witness or something where you have to like you know saw like like really think hard. You know, spend ten minutes on a puzzle. Um, but that I didn't. I don't think that's often very interesting. I do. That's not me knocking the witness because actually I love the witness. That's like one of my favorite games I played this year. But just in general, um, making making time consuming puzzles is not very hard from a developer perspective um so i in a way i i really that was one of the disadvantages of trying to do the puzzles this way because i couldn't just kind of repeat the puzzles but but had i done that it could have made the game a lot longer but um but i think we ended up with something good so so i'm not not upset about it just sort of explaining uh how that's that's kind of a unique challenge when you try and do do puzzles in that way. I really enjoy making books and book titles for games. I I sort of always have a running list of titles that I think are funny or interesting and then and then try and work them into different games. I was in New Orleans at a like a rare bookshop or something just checking out the books there and I saw this book which was basically like when when good fellows gather or something like that this very like 1950s like we are white men who get together and what you know what what do us white men talk about and i just thought that was such a weird book that you just totally would not see published today and that kind of it got me thinking and i guess with some of the inspiration for some of these books here just just thinking about what like a, a you know a proper you know a man from the 1890s who was a, a man of science and history but also just like a 
misogynist, racist kind of guy, but when, at a time when it was like you weren't even misogynistic or, or racist for thinking that way, that was just like the way things were done. So you would have these these books that were written about like, you know, like here, a guide to discussing the lesser races. That's like, you know, that was just very weird and, you know, disturbing and surreal. Um, uh, a Brief History of the Vagina, A Man's Perspective. Again, just so like, like, that that a, <laughs> that a book would be written um, about a vagina from like a, you know as if the man's opinion was more important or something. Um, just I felt like these books really uh, explained the character in, in a nice way. Uh, I don't know how many people actually ever read the book titles, but I I put a lot of work into uh, into thinking of them, so I thought they would be be worth mentioning. The music in the game was done by a guy named Sean Jones. Uh, He did the music for The Static Speaks My Name. Uh, He's based in Austin, Texas, uh, or maybe somewhere outside of Austin, I guess now. Uh, But he's uh, an American guy. And uh, yeah, I just had worked with him doing The Static Speaks My Name. I really liked, I thought the music turned out really well for that. I mean, I remember a lot of the comments about The Static Speaks My Name was that you know, the music was one of the best parts, which I agree with. I think it, it, it really, that, that game relies a lot on, on the music. Um, so he did three songs for this game. He did a song for, he did the song for the uh, cinematics. Uh, he did a song for the, the theater slash crypt room, the green room with the urns in it. Um, and he did the music that, that plays right before you, uh, the last scene where you uh, find the baby and, and uh, the cultists and all that. It just so happened that at the time that I was thinking about music for the game, I had been listening a bunch to the Gone Girl soundtrack, and it's a really, really good soundtrack. I really recommend it if you haven't listened to it. But uh, so all the, the the three songs that Sean did, all of them were more or less inspired by some tracks uh, from Gone Girl. So the cinematics track was inspired by uh, a track called Clue One. And it, that one was the most, that one sort of deviated a lot more from actually the reference. It, it sounds, it's just very different than, than the reference. But uh, there's a song called Background Noise on the Gone Girl soundtrack, which is the reference for the theater and crypt piano music. And I think if you listen to that song and then you listen to the, the music in Bucket Detective, you're, you'll, you'll very much hear the connection. And then the last one is uh, is called Clue 2. <laughs> and uh, that's the song for the, the room where you find the baby. And uh, we, we used for uh, for the credits, there were, that was just stock music that I found. Uh, I used a website called freesfx.co.uk, which has royalty-free stock music. And uh, yeah, you can actually find some really, really cool stock music out there, especially if you're kind of... I guess I make weird enough games that sometimes... There's a lot of stock music out there that I think wouldn't fit most projects, but I, I can find a way to make it work. I had a little one-minute game called Jump to Win, uh, which also used stock music, and I thought the music was... <laughs> I loved the music that was in that, too. Um, the sound design for the game was done by a friend of mine named Dennis Loban, who is a, uh, a Russian guy originally, but he uh, is based in Finland now. Um, he actually just started working at Red Lynx, which is like a subsidiary of Ubisoft. So we were very lucky that uh, we got him to, uh, to do the sounds for this game before he started um, actually getting uh, paid real money. Yeah, he did the sounds for this, uh, put in a massive amount of effort. I, uh, I, I, I really owe him a lot. I mean, we got such higher quality sounds than I could have imagined. Uh, I mean, originally I was going to do the sound design for the game. I was just like, ah, it's fine. I'll just do some footsteps and all this stuff. And, uh, and, but once I started, you know, once I talked to him about doing it and hearing the quality of the stuff that he was making, I, I decided that, you know, I, I, that was the right choice to make. And originally, there was going to be the cinematics music. The first song in the game was going to play over the entire first floor. But once I heard his sounds, I realized that there was sort of this really eerie, quiet... The, the sounds were so good that the game needed to have a lot of parts where it was just completely quiet with like ambient house noise and little creaks in the background and hearing the player footsteps and the button pushes and the picking up items. It just, uh, it it actually ended up adding more to the mood in some places than having music. 
Uh, so, and that's that's totally a, a you know attributed to just the quality of the sounds. 